This is That's in the Bible.com. That's in the Bible, episode 162 God's Battle Axe. Troubles and times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedoms we all hold dear, now is that stake. Humbling your hearts to God, saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians away. Hello, welcome back to That's in the Bible. My name is Eric. Glad you could join us for another episode of That's in the Bible, the podcast that looks at what does the Bible say on a variety of different issues. Today, returning guest, Robert Militello from beautiful Pensacola, Florida. Although, as he was telling me before we started the show, you guys had a little bit of a rain overnight there. Yeah, we had tornado warnings flashing on the TV and on the telephone and it makes people here very uh, tense and anxious. Amen. But nothing touched down immediately near me. In some other places, there were some twisters. But they're scary. They're scary, brother. Amen. <laughs> I know. I lived as a as a uh, as a kid in um, Texas, San Antonio. We used to uh-huh. have some tornado warnings yeah. there as well. Well, you've got Amen. you've got for us today God's battle axe. Interested in yep. hearing what you have for us today? So go ahead and and take it away. All right, brother. First, I want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity to teach uh, with the body of Christ. Uh, the, the God's battle axe is the only time it shows up. Battle axe is here in Jeremiah. So if the listeners want to turn to Jeremiah fifty one. We'll begin at verse 19. Again, please forgive me if the recording comes off. uh, Not that. It's my cheap phone. It's not Brother Eric's equipment. It's this cheap phone that I had for a number of years. So I don't have a cold uh, or nasal blockage or or lung problems. I'm I'm doing okay by the grace of God. Uh, But going back to Jeremiah 51. Now, Israel is God's battle axe, if you haven't figured that out. And uh, right now, we we as believers are living in a transition period, just like in the early Acts period when the transitioning occurred uh, between the Old Testament sacrificial system and the establishment of the church with that small group in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, We're in that kind of a period now when the uh, Pentecost came and the church, many people feel the church was born that morning and formed. Uh, You had a 37-year period. uh, And then in 70 AD, you had the destruction of the Jewish temple by the Romans under Titus. So you had a 37-year 30 year transition from the new way of honoring the Lord and putting your faith in him and receiving forgiveness and cleansing through the shed blood, which none of the Jews really knew about, especially in the early Acts period. They didn't know anything about that. Uh And then the Old Testament sacrifices were eliminated in 70 AD. Now, if you were a Jew going to temple in those days, every Passover and every Pentecost and every Feast of Tabernacles, because those were the three holidays, you were expected to go to the temple and make your sacrifices. Uh, All of a sudden, there was no temple. It was over. And you say to yourself, what do I do? I can't make an offering to God. And Leviticus tells me, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Leviticus 17 says, so now what do I do? Well, the door had been opened earlier uh, with the apostles proclaiming the gospel. At first, it wasn't the gospel of the grace of God that Paul taught. It was Peter saying, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And All the Jews were told then was, you killed your Messiah, and you're in trouble (laughs) with the God of Israel. They got scared. Many of them got converted. Uh, But there was no temple sacrifice. And I think I might have said this in, in another broadcast. I asked a Jew once, what do you do when you can't perform the commandment of Torah and you cannot? Uh, offer a blood sacrifice 
He says, well, we, we rely on our mitzvahs, M-I-T-Z-V-A-H-S. Mitzvahs are good works. And hopefully uh, that will uh, that that will please God. He says, but it's not an atonement for your soul. It's not a blood sacrifice. He says, I know this fellow, uh, Yaakov, told me, uh, but what can we do? I says, well, you know how the Lord looks at those uh, mitzvahs. I said, you read Isaiah and uh, all your good works and your it, it, nothing but rags in his sight. Filthy rags. That's your, it, it's not going to get over. You need a blood sacrifice. And the only one you can find would be the, Jesus Christ, who was called the Lamb of God. When John the, And you don't put your faith in him. You have no blood sacrifice. All the mitzvahs in the world are not going to give you on the good side of the God of Israel. And he was taken aback, I don't have to tell you. But I said, there has to be a reason why the Lord God of Israel eliminated the, the temple sacrificial system and put you in a place where you couldn't perform the commandment you were told to perform. So you had to go to the Lord and find out why. And I wasn't too anxious. You know, people say they want the truth, they love the truth. Uh, believe me, most of them don't. Yeah, they just they say that because that's the thing to say. But when the truth comes or they kind of sense the truth is going to cut at their beliefs and feelings or emotions or whatever, they push it away as quickly as they can or walk away from it like Pilate did when he said, what is truth? He didn't even wait for an answer from the Lord. He walked away. Look it up. And the Lord had said, I'm the way, the truth and the light. Do you really want truth? You say you do. Well, let's go to this portion, beginning with verse 19. <clears throat> it says, the portion of Jacob is not like them. That, that's the nations of the world. That's the Gentiles. For he is the former of all things. That's Jacob. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Notice the word rod there coming before the word battle axe in the next verse. Now, it says in Psalm, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod is a weapon. The, the rod was used years ago by teachers to give you a whacking and by your father or, or a belt. But a rod is God's way of reminding you, I love you. Yeah, that's what it's there for. I love you. And you go back to Aaron's rod, and a rod is the kind of thing that shows God's power. Aaron's rod. I, I, the, the rod broke the power of Pharaoh when you come to think of it. It was that rod. And Moses stretching forth his rod, opening up the Red Sea. So he says here, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. So what is he going to do with that rod? He's going to smite the nations. God the Father is going to put his, his son on the throne where he belongs. That's the plan of God. And we're in that transition period right now. If you follow current events somewhat and you're familiar with the Bible, you, you ought to know it. You ought to see it. Say, Wait a second. Something's happening. The, the church is failing. When, when the soul loses its savior, it's not good for anything except to be trodden underfoot. And, this, and the church has lost its soul. It's not doing what God wants it to do, calling out sin, warning people about hell. Instead, you've got these people on TV like, uh, oh, that guy that is always batting his eyes, the guy from Houston there, Joel Osteen, and telling everybody how much God loves them and he wants to do everything for them and prosper them and all of that. That's, that's what's happened to the church. So we're transitioning now, and you could see it. I think it began October 7th when the Lord allowed the Hamas terrorists and murderers to come in and kill 1,200 and some odd Israelis. I think that was kind of a, 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 a signal, at least in my mind, that the Lord was now turning his attention to Israel in a big way and preparing the nations. How do I, what do I mean by preparing the nations? By getting ready to bundle them together with one unifying thought, one unifying purpose. Get rid of Israel. Neutralize Israel. Smash its independence. And that's what's going to begin to happen. And uh, he says here in the next verse, Thou art my battle axe. That's Israel. Thou art my battle axe. Dr. Ruckman says it's a reference to the Antichrist. Well, yeah, in a way, but 
I see it as Israel. Thou art my battle axe. Why? Because it says, and weapons of war. And weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations. And with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Look at that carefully. Are the Roman soldiers among their weapons and their dagger, <coughs> they carried a battle axe. And uh, Josephus, in his uh, history of the Jews there at, this, at the temple when it was being destroyed, talked about the Romans uh, butchering the Levites and the priests that, that were stationed around the temple, guarding the temple, trying to save the temple from destruction. And they were just hacked away in pieces. It was just a bloody scene. Well, when the wrath of God comes out, now these are God's people. These were Levites and priests. What were they trying to do? Protect the temple? Protect the temple? Where the ark was? No, the ark was gone after the first temple. Where the name of the Lord had been placed. And they were hacked to pieces. So he says, thou art my battle axe. And where do you find that? In verse 19, it says, Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Thou art my battle axe. For with thee, what am I going to do with you? For with thee will I break in pieces the nations. Well, the process has begun. First, you have to bundle the nations before you destroy them. And that you'll find in Zephaniah 3H. 3H, I'm sorry. And with thee will I destroy kingdoms. Well, he has before and he's going to do it again. This time it's going to be a big deal. Now, the Lord's battle axe uh, is the result. Why he's going to use it is the result of a controversy. The Bible talks about a controversy with the nations and the Lord. See Jeremiah 2531. If you'll turn to Jeremiah 2531, you'll see what I'm talking about. He has. uh, Oh, look at this. This is something. Verse 31. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord, what? This is Jeremiah 25, 31. Hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Wow. Look at verse 32. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation. Is the tribulation. And a great whirlwind. But well, what can that be other than some sort of super giant tornado shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth? Watch that one. When the Lord refers in his word to the coasts of the earth, it could be meaning the new territories like us, the new hemisphere that was settled by the Spanish and British. And that's the tribulation. You know it from verse 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Who who teaches on, you know, not many churches preach this stuff. It's the wrath of God. You're not going to find, you know, Rick Warren, Joel Osteen, and all these guys on Trinity Broadcast and Daystar talking much about this because it doesn't uh, bring the people in and it doesn't uh, cause the money to come in. But this controversy, God has a controversy in verse 31 with the nations. What is that? He has a score to settle with them. Over what? Over stolen land. The nations, the Gentiles, have always tried to rob Israel of its inheritance. And we know about that inheritance going back to Abraham, his descendants, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the controversy, this picking away at Israel, this trying to steal their land. This It's God's land. It's God's land. And you got to be out of your mind. Well, if you don't know the Lord, you'll think you'll get away with it. Look at Isaiah 34, verse 8. Isaiah 34 mentions it again. He says in Isaiah 34, verse 8, for it is the day, this is the tribulation, which is coming. Sooner than we might think, for it is the Lord's vengeance, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. By the way, that's the part of the Isaiah scroll that the Lord did not finish reading when he stood up in the temple. And he was reading from the Isaiah scroll, uh, which was uh, a portion of scripture that talked about the coming of the Messiah. 
and he said, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. But when you look it up, he leaves this last part out. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for what? For the controversy of Zion. Well, now you know what the controversy is about. It's about Zion. Who owns it? Who does it belong to? Well, God owns it. And he gave it to his people to settle Jacob's descendants there. That's who owns it. Who's got the title deed to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? David got it. When he when he made that sacrifice in Aruna, he, he gave money. He didn't want a free offering from Aruna the Jebusite. This was when the plague was hitting the Jewish people, uh, and, and David cried out for the Lord to stop the plague, and he had to make this sacrifice. And it was at that time that Arona gave him the, the Jebusite king, gave him that area, that temple mount. He's got the title deed to that temple mount. And who has it today? His descendants, the Jews, the, the, the descendants of David, they own that land. It was given to them, you know, on Palm Sunday when the Lord came in. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, and son of David, Hosanna. They knew he, many knew he was, believed him to be the son of David, and he was the rightful heir, but he was denied what he should have gotten. You know, the wrath of God is not something a lot of Christians want to uh, dote on. And, and I don't blame them. It's a scary thing. I was thinking the other day, this wrath that's coming on the nations, they have no clue. They don't believe the Bible. They don't want to even hear it. But I was thinking about how severe it's going to be. Prop close to 70% of the world's population might be wiped out, according to what I'm reading in Revelation when I do the figures, I think we're, what, seven and a half billion now in the world? Yeah. Wow. Now, the wrath of God is going to be poured out on these nations. He's finally going to deal with them and destroy the world system and set up his kingdom. Now, isn't it strange, as far as sinners being under the wrath of God, which, by the way, you are if you're lost, whether you know it or not, a sinner lost is under the wrath of God. It hangs over his or her head. And the Bible says the Lord is angry with the wicked every day. You ever hear that preached on television? Yes, you hear certain verses, many verses, they won't touch with a 10-foot pole. And that anger, when you pass away, lost in a lost condition, your soul goes to hell. And the punishment begins. But the final settling of the controversy God has with you as an individual sinner is not going to take place until a thousand years later at the resurrection. A thousand years later at the white throne judgment, you're going to have your final hearing. You're going to come out of hell and stand before the Lord. And the charges will be brought against you and you'll be condemned. Uh, along with uh, as angels too. I mean, it's going to be a scary place. But look at that. The Lord waits a thousand years before he makes a final settlement with an unsaved sinner. But here he's not waiting a thousand years. Here he's going to bring his wrath upon the nations very soon. Hopefully soon enough that many of us are alive today. Well, we'll escape it with the rapture. Thank God we won't. We'll be in heaven. We won't know how it's going on down here. We'll know from the scripture what's happening. But uh, when I think about that, the Lord seems more anxious right now to gather the nations and destroy them and put his son on the throne than he is dealing and sealing the fate of individual sinners who died lost, who rejected the gospel, or felt that their goodness and their self-righteousness was somehow going to get them to heaven. That's an unbelievable thing when you think about it. So this wrath has been building up and building up and building up for a couple of thousand years, for a couple of thousand years. And uh, now I see what, what's going on in the world. And I follow events in Israel pretty closely. Uh, we're there. The, the, tr the transition has started. And, and my theory is it, it started with this building up now of all the anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment that you're seeing in all the nations now, every day. Even our president, you know, 
preaching to Netanyahu as to how he should run his country and carry out his policies. This is unbelievable. We're such a self-righteous, hypocritical nation when you think about it. We tell others you're not to meddle in the affairs of, of any sovereign nation in their politics. Just leave them alone. Those are internal affairs. And yet we do it all the time. You know, Obama years ago had sent the uh, operatives, some of his campaign people, in the Israeli election uh, to undo Netanyahu. He, he won that election. I don't know, this was a while ago, a number of years ago. I don't have the exact year. But we attempted, Obama and the Democratic Party attempted to get rid of Netanyahu at that time. The Lord wouldn't allow it, thank God. But we do that all the time. It's called regime change. We don't like the leader of a country. We try and uh, get rid of them. We did that with, uh, well, in Latin America, we've done it historically many times. Uh, so changing uh, ladies there, like you might change your underwear. I mean, it's ridiculous, but that's what we try and do. Our CIA specializes in that. So here we are in this transition period and this anger that's building up. Just the other day, I, I read the paper where little Nicaragua, I mean, who cares about Nicaragua, right? Lecturing Germany at the UN and telling the German ambassador there that they had no business sending any equipment to Israel. That Israel was a pariah nation, it was committing genocide and all this other stuff. And they said, well, Nicaragua, what are you what are you sticking your nose? What is it about Israel that obsesses the UN? Three quarters of all the condemnatory resolutions they passed have been against Israel. And you know why God is calling Israel his battle axe? That's going to be the weapon in his hand where he's going to cut these nations to pieces. And they're earning their fate right now by ganging up on Israel and trying to just deny them weapons and whatever else they really need. But brothers and sisters, it, it has begun in our lifetime. And as Christians, you, you have to be excited about this. You know, the coming of the Lord is very near. And this transition period is, is equivalent to what happened when the church started and the uh, Old Testament uh, temple sacrificial system was destroyed. There was that 37 year gap. Now, I don't I don't know how long the transition will go on. Uh, it ends with the removal of the church. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that tells you the time gap between the removal of the church and the coming of the Lord at the second coming. It could be more than seven years, three and a half years. Some believe 10 years. Larkin believed even more. We, we just don't know. There's, there could be a significant gap there. Just because the church leaves doesn't mean overnight. The Antichrist establishes his kingdom or they build a temple right away and they start running things. No, we must be removed first. And there's good cause for the Lord to remove us very soon because the church has become, by and large, unfortunately, at least here in America, inefficient, inefficient. Now, as far as the Bible predicting the future and telling you what's going to happen before it happens, some years ago, the Lord showed me something. In the scripture, in the little book of Joel, if you'll turn to Joel chapter 3, and here's what he showed me, chapter 3. Because I got sometimes in discussions with people, well, how do you know God wrote the Bible? You know, a man wrote it, and I hear all this nonsense. Well, today, which, what's happening in Israel, uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, if you read the Bible enough, you'll you'll know that there's something about Israel that the devil hates and that the world hates. And the world has become more and more conformed now in these last 30, 40, 50 years uh, than ever before. The nations of the world are more inclined now to have the devil lead them by the by the nose. And even the Vatican, I, I remember the, the church when I was a kid, it's much different. Now it's not. It has lined up with the world on almost every issue, except homosexual marriage, but that's coming. But it has lined up with the world on climate change and the, the need for a World Bank. I mean, all kinds of issues. Uh, that wasn't the case. And even this Pope, this Jesuit Pope, telling people, well, uh, there's other ways to God. Well, what do you mean? 
he was asked about, you know, people who never heard the gospel, if they died and they were sincere and they were moral, all of that, can they get to heaven? He said something like, who am I to judge? I mean, that's a stupid thing. The scripture says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. Why send out missionaries? There's other ways to God. But getting back to this, Joel, if you look at chapter 3, and this is what the Lord has done in your life, well, my lifetime. I was born in 46, and not long after, uh, Israel developed its own nuclear weapons. Praise the Lord for that. But look at this verse, chapter 3. It's an Armageddon verse. It's the judgment of the nations. But look what he says in verse 10. Beat your swords, in, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. What is this about? Well, verse 9, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Now, it's happening. This world has weapons ready to bust out and destroy one another. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your sword, your plowshares into swords. That's right. Arm yourselves. Get all the weapons you can. And destruct as destructive as they can possibly be. Get ready to murder millions, to kill millions, not just thousands, but millions upon millions. Now here, let the weak say, I am strong. Well, what is that? Let the weak say, I am strong. I showed this once to, a, I don't know if it was a pastor or what. I said to him, look, here, you know you, the Lord has already told you what's going to happen here in the last days. When in history has any small nation been able to tell a large, powerful, aggressive nation, don't come at me, I can hurt you. When has that ever happened in history? Small nations have been gobbled up by their powerful neighbors, whether it was Rome, Babylon, Persia, Greece, whatever. All through history, Hitler gobbled up almost all of Europe. And the weak couldn't say, stay away from me, I can hurt you. But with the advent of nuclear weapons... Even a small nation like Israel, and that's a small nation, can turn to a larger nation, whether it's Russia or anybody else, and say, I can hurt you. I have nuclear weapons, and I can destroy your cities and, and level them and kill millions. That never happened before in history. The weak nations were never in a position to say that to a powerful, aggressive nation, aggressive nation that wanted to gobble them up. But now they are in our lifetime. This began with the development of nuclear weapons. And now what do you have? You have countries like Pakistan has nuclear weapons, North Korea. And they're always threatening the United States, China and Russia. They've had them going back, I think, to the late 40s or the 50s. And actually, South Africa. Yeah, the South Africa, when it was ruled by a white minority government, Israel had helped South Africa develop its nuclear program. And now Iran is developing its nuclear program, although they say they're not. It's going to be for, you know, peaceful purposes. Don't you believe it? But that has changed the equation in our lifetime. So when someone says to me, <coughs> Militello, didn't men write that? I says. Oh, who could see the future? Who but God could put this here? Let the weak say, I am strong. When did that ever happen? It never did. Now it's it's real. It's possible. Amen. And by the way, brothers and sisters, there's other places I can go to where I could show you conclusively. It had to be God that wrote the Bible. Who sees this far ahead and tells you what's going to happen before it happens? He does. We don't. We don't know. That's why I see on TV these commercials for spiritualists and fortune tellers and all that. What a waste of time and money. No one but God really knows what's going to happen tomorrow. 
Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Well, we know from the scriptures what's going to happen with Israel. Somehow, some way, the Netanyahu government will be replaced. And there'll be a government put in there that's more amenable to a peace deal. And a certain kind of peace deal that will give the Jewish people the sense of peace and safety. Like Paul said, when they shall say peace and safety, then cometh sudden destruction. And the Lord has a way of doing that. When you think all is well, he pulls out the rug from under your feet. If you're not walking with him. <laughs> so they're, they're being set up. Now, right now, I pray for their government. I, I admire Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and I, I, he stands up. He's standing up to pressure from the world that no world leader has ever gotten in history. It's, it's never happened before. We're almost the entire world, the so-called family of nations, is pointing fingers at him every day. And his, his IDF and calling of murderers committing genocide. Israel should have never joined the U.N. Uh, the rabbis told that to Ben-Gurion in 1948-49. They were finally admitted in 49. And they told Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, that the Torah in the book of Numbers said that we are to dwell alone. We're a separate nation. We're not to be numbered among the Gentile nations. Why would you want to join this organization of Gentile nations who really don't like you? It might not at that time be manifest, but over time it will. The hatred will come out. Now it's coming out full bloom. It's like the devil in a way has taken off his mask and making himself more and more visible in what he's doing with the nations. Now, nations have demonic powers that are over them. You learn that from Daniel, the evil prince of Persia, The when uh, uh, Michael was to send a message to D Daniel. Uh, the prince of Grecia, Greece, they have powers. Paul talks about them, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. And I, I got to believe that the United States uh, lately has some evil powers over its atmosphere that have just about gobbled up Washington, D.C. and the thinking of our State Department and our diplomats and our foreign policy being more and more crafted by these graduates of Georgetown University who go to the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and then wind up working for the government in the State Department or the National Security Council or the defense industry. Oh, and by the way, Georgetown University is a Jesuit institution. Did you know that? The Jesuits have more to say about which direction this country is going to take than any other group of people anywhere, okay? They're, they're frightening, I know. I, I went to their school. They're, they're the powers of darkness wearing their dark clothing and calling themselves the nerve to call themselves the Society of Jesus. Would you believe that? <laughs> the Society of Satan is what they should be called, SS. So our thinking, our State Department, our government is now uh, more willing to oppose Israel for various political reasons also. The president wants to be reelected. God help us. So this is where it's headed. And uh, as a Christian, I, I'm excited. I, I say, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. That's what the Bible ends with. We're strangers. We're pilgrims down here. We're passing through. This is not our home. It's nothing to worry about and get upset over. But we should, with all of this that the Lord is allowing us to see in these last days, we should have sympathy for Israel. We should have that compassion, that sense of here's a people that have been persecuted, and have gone through, I know, much of their own stubbornness, their desire to be liked by the Gentile nations has hurt them. But the nations have picked on them over the years, and now God has a controversy with these nations. And where, the Pal where Gaza is, that land belongs to Israel. It was given to David <laughs> when David cleaned out the Philistines there when he was king. And it became part of the uh, territory of Israel. They had they, they, Gaza was uh, occupied by Israel after the 67 war. And Israel put settlements there. 
and turned many, uh, much of the land into gardens and built things there. It became a nice place. And then they turned it over, believe it or not, to the Palestinians. What a foolish move. That was at the urging of Junior Bush, President Bush, who convinced the Israeli prime minister at the time, Ariel Sharon, to abandon Gaza and turn it over to the Palestinians. Why? Well, because if you give them the land, you'll have peace on, on your border with, with Gaza. It never happened. And anybody who believed that need, needed their head examined. But Ariel Sharon, he believed it. Got a stroke after that, never talked after that. And that was our President Bush with the Georgetown State Department influence telling him, give, give Gaza back to the Palestinians. And no sooner the Palestinians came back, uh, ripped apart the Jewish settlements, tore down everything that was good, and turned the place into one large garbage dump. That's all it is. One large garbage dump, Gaza City and Rafa and all their, it, even the other Arab nations don't want anything to do with the Palestinians, okay? It's the so-called Ishmael's brothers, uh, stay away from us. You're nothing but trouble. And, uh, and they are. So God has a controversy, especially with these uh, Gazans, the Philistines. By the way, there is a war coming. Uh, I call it the War of 83. It's Psalm 83. And uh, the controversy is going to be breaking out uh, clearly in that war with Israel's neighbors. So if you study Psalm 83, now it's, it's a local war. This is not Armageddon. Psalm 83 is showing you it's not, it's not Armageddon. Uh, but it's going to happen either just before the rapture. We might see it. We might be here to see this or immediately after the rapture. If you look at that uh, uh, psalm, keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace and be not still, O God, for lo, thine enemies make a tumult and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. That's today. It's the UN. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, I'm in verse 4, Psalm 83. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no, be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Wow. The tabernacles of Edom. And the Ishmaelites of Moab, that's Jordan, and of the Hagarines, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, that's the and the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. Tyre is Lebanon. That's that's Hezbollah up north of Galilee. There it is in verse seven. The Philistines and that's Gaza and uh, the inhabitants of Tyre. Asur also is joined with them. They have hope in the children of Lot. That's verse 8. Do unto them as unto the Midianites and to Sisera and to Jabin at the brook Kisan. Wow. This is amazing. This is a war. This is, a, this is something that's going to break out. So persecute them with thy tempest. That's verse 15. Let them be confounded and troubled. Verse 17. Forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. Why? Verse 18. That men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah, and it's in caps. Look at it in your King James Bible. That's rare. Look at that. Jehovah in caps, verse 18. Wow. Art the most high. Whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Can you imagine a Jew waving that verse in front of a Muslim and saying, Allah, forget about him. Look at what my God says in verse 18. That men may know, okay, you Muslims, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, not Allah, art the most high over all the earth. They're wasting their time praying to Allah. I mean, it's a, I remember an Arab telling me in New York City once when the war broke out, and uh, that was 73, the October War. I says, the Jews will win. Eventually, they'll win. And all the prayers that these, the Egypt and Syria, and all the prayers being said to Allah and all the mosques 
are going to fall on deaf ears because Allah can't do anything against the Jews. He's not going to prevail. And he didn't want to hear that. He says, you know, you could uh, be put in jail in my country for saying stuff like that. I says, yeah, I know. That's why you came to America. So, so you could say the things you want to say without worried about being picked up and put in jail. Although today, brothers and sisters, the tides are turning. The so-called freedom of speech is uh, not the kind of freedom of speech your grandfathers enjoyed. <laughs> well, that's about all I got to say at this point about the Lord's battle axe. And you'll find that they're alone in Jeremiah 51, 19, 23. He's going to swing that axe and cut the nations to, p to pieces. And that's God the Father fulfilling his promise to the Son, to set his Son on the throne. And we as Christians, we yearn for it. We want to see it. Amen. Amen. Hey. Okay, brother. Hey, amen. Thank you, Brother Militello, for a... Boy, that was a that was a true Bible study and uh, tied in yeah. with current events. It's it's good stuff, and um, I'm going to listen to that one again as well and go over that. Uh, that you're right. That's stuff that you don't hear typically. Yeah. No, no, brother. It's not really taught. Uh, any average Christian today is not really. You know, it's a personal thing. Their relationship with the Lord is the most important thing. It's the first duty of a Christian to walk with the Lord. I understand that. But to have knowledge of these things is important. So you know where you are. It's like driving along, you know, without a map or GPS. And you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. But when you see things today happening, if you have any knowledge of the Bible and you look around and you understand some of these current events and it's happening now, you should figure out, you know, we're in a transition. God is turning from the church to Israel right in our day. And, I mean, how, how much do you have to know before you prepare to meet thy God? What's going to get the Christian in shape to appear at the judgment seat of Christ and put a smile on his face? And how can they be caught by surprise with all that's happening? And yet many will, they're caught up in the cares, they're choked by the cares of this world. I understand that. It's a, it's a problem. But to take away from your understanding of what the Lord is doing in your life and in your time, I don't think there's any excuse for that. And that's what the Lord said when he met those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he insulted them and he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe what? All that the prophets have written. What, not Christ to have suffered? It's telling them, come on, you went to Jewish school as kids. Didn't you learn about Messiah having to suffer? Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Zechariah. I mean, it's all over the place. How did you miss it? Why? Because they were concentrating on the positive aspects of Messiah. That when he comes, he would overthrow the Roman rule. He would restore the kingdom of David. And there would finally be peace and happiness and security. And that's the human mind. That's I want to look at all the good things. I want to think about that. That lifts me up. But the Lord chastised them and said, you're fools. You should have known all that the prophets, the positive and the negative. I think that's going to be something that's going to be said at the judgment seat of Christ of many of God's people. He called his own people fools. Fools. And how many times in the gospel? Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? What are they doing? Playing chess, checkers, watching TV? What are they, what? They're not reading. They don't know what's going on. Why not? Sad, brother. We're in a, we're in a dark time. Well, brother, well we, thanks uh, for the opportunity. I really appreciate talking to the subscribers you have, brother, and giving it over to the other brother, letting people hear this and learn and uh, find out that the Bible is loaded with things like I showed you in Joel that predict the future long before it happens. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, brother. Take care, Thanks. and uh, Lord willing, we'll have you again uh, back on the program real soon. Okay, God bless you, Brother Eric. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. This has been a production of the That's in the Bible podcast. To leave a comment or to ask a question, visit our website at thatsinthebible.com or email us at thatsinthebible at gmail.com or call our listener feedback voicemail at 
1611. Again, that's 716 584 1611. As always, thanks for listening and press on. Have a great day.